Thank you, worship team. I just really want to. I just really want you to understand how uh, I just really want you to understand how much we should appreciate our worship pastor, Kendall Honeycutt, yeah. wait a minute, who was not on the platform tonight. I've, uh, over my 40-year career in the ministry, I've served with a lot of really, really great worship pastors. We, I mean, we've had some good ones. Here and in other churches that I've pastored, we've had some great worship pastors. But the thing about Kendall is Kendall will stay off the platform for weeks. There are people who don't even know she's the worship pastor because she's not up here because she's equipping other people to lead worship. And so tonight she was supposed to be on the platform and uh, through some, some circumstances and things at the last minute she wasn't able to be up here. And, I mean, I've been in churches where, well, our worship pastor is not up here. I guess we're not going to have worship tonight. <laughs> we love you, Kendall, but we didn't miss you up here tonight because of the people that you equipped. Amen. So thank you. <clears throat> tonight, we want to uh, we wanna talk about developing faith, how to develop life-changing faith. How many of you trust God? We hear a lot about faith, a lot about trusting God in, in our situations, trusting God with our finances, trusting God in, in our health, trusting God with our families. But tonight we're going to talk about faith and what true faith is. Because we, we hear about that all the time, and, and it is, the, it is the, the correct answer. We all know the correct answer, don't we? How many of us trust God? Yes. But we can't trust God if we don't understand what true faith is, because that's what true faith is, trusting God. So many times, Jesus ministered to people, not every time, but some of the times when Jesus ministered to people, he would say to them, do you, be, now before I do this, do you believe I can do this? There were people who said, yes, Lord, I believe that you can. Then there, were, there was the one guy who said, well, Lord, I believe, but would you please help that area in my life where I have unbelief? He, at least he was honest with himself. Uh, you know, I didn't hear a single person in here when I asked that question say, well, you know, I love God, but I'm not sure I trust him. But I, I find a lot of us are maybe in that situation or maybe not. Maybe it's easy for us to trust him with our health and not with our finances or vice versa. It's easy to trust him with our finances, but not with our family. And so we want to talk tonight about what faith is. Is that okay? Amen. Luke chapter 18, verse 8. Oh, and before we go on, I want to say hello to my sweetheart, who's not, which camera am I talking to her in? This one, the green one right here. I want to say I love you, sweetheart. She's at home, and she is recovering nicely. She's doing so well recovering from having pneumonia. But she's doing, oh, don't, don't moan. She's doing so good. And she almost came tonight, but she stayed home, and she prayed for me before I came, and so that's how I know the anointment of God is on me, because <laughs> Connie prayed for me. Love you, sweetheart. Luke chapter 18, verse 8, <clears throat> Jesus asked this question. I love this question. When the Son of Man comes, when Jesus returns, how many of us are looking for the return of Christ? Jesus said, when, when the Son of Man comes, Will he really find faith on the earth? Think about that. He could have said, when I come back, am I going to find you praying? When I come back, am I going to find you this? Am I going to find that? Am I going to find you doing this? Jesus asked his disciples, when I return, will I really find faith on the earth? That tells me he's going to be looking for it. So we're all excited about 
Jesus is going to come. Jesus is going to come back. The rapture is going to take place. The trumpet is going to sound. The dead in Christ are going to rise first. And then those of us who are alive are going to meet him in the air. And, uh, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. That's wonderful. But Jesus said, wait, 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 wait. When I return, will I really find faith on the earth? And most of us, we're, we're so, so many of us are parked at the rapture bus stop <laughs> waiting for Jesus to come. Give me, how, how many of you, I mean, the, earth, the, the world is getting crazy. You know, Connie looked at me the other day and said, look, she saw something on the news and she just looked at me and said, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Amen. Yeah, I mean, a lot of us are there, but the, but. Oftentimes, we don't think about this aspect. When Jesus returns, though, will he find faith on the earth? Is he going to find us walking in faith? So let's talk about that. We hear so much about faith and having faith, but many of us really don't understand what faith is and why it's important. So we don't consciously cultivate. I want you to, I want you to get that. We don't understand what faith is sometimes, so we don't consciously cultivate our faith we don't consciously grow in faith and we don't consciously keep our faith strong there are people that are new to church new to christianity there are people here tonight are brand new christians going oh i didn't i didn't know i needed this let's i want to talk about it but the but many of us we have to guard our hearts because how many of, in, of you in here would say you've heard at least a hundred messages on faith? Raise your hand. We're the ones that are in the most danger. There are those of us who, who began with a strong faith message, and we've heard a lot of strong faith messages, but then, listen to this, after our faith worked, and we got out of the desperation that that drove us to faith, we got comfortable and stopped living by faith. Galatians chapter 3, verse 3 in the Amplified Bible. Are you so foolish and senseless, having begun your new life by faith with the Spirit, are you now being perfected and reaching spiritual maturity by the flesh? Now, in context, this is talking about our salvation. But it's true in every other area of our life. I don't know about your circumstances, but I remember when Connie and I had to pay our bills by faith. I, re I remember being, I remember writing that tithe check out. We're just trembling, going, if I write this tithe check out, how are we going to buy groceries? I remember, I remember when the kids, kids were young. If I, I mean, if I, if I write this tithe check out, then how, how are we going to pay the, the electric bill on Wednesday? I've been there. I know what it's like to drive a car, and you have to pray that the car can get you back and forth to work, either because the car wasn't working or there wasn't enough gas in the tank technically to get you back and forth to work. Some of you have never been there. You don't have any idea what I'm talking about. But I remember having to walk by faith. I remember having to be healed by faith because we didn't have enough, any insurance and we couldn't afford to go to the doctor. We had to be healed by faith. <clears throat> but now, I pull the car out of the garage and it doesn't sound quite right. I just pull it back in the garage and get the other car out. <laughs> think we think we don't feel too good? Call the doctor. I mean, we got we get insurance. The insurance is going to pay for it. I know what it's like to to write out our tithe and not give it a second thought because we have so much left over after that, pay our bills, everything else, put money in a savings account, and I don't write my tithe checks trembling anymore. That's a dangerous place to be because when Jesus returns, he's looking for faith. 
And many of us, we walked by faith for so long and our faith manifested and we got blessed so much that now our Christian life is on autopilot. And it's not, now here's where I want to get you to though. It's not that we don't need to walk by faith. We need to walk by faith. It's that now the faith projects are bigger and the faith projects involve other people. I'm not trying to pay my bills anymore, but now what are we doing? Now we're believing God for the church to be able to reach the multitudes of people in this community that we need to reach. So, so often, hey, I got mine. I got my stuff. I'm good now. And how many of us have prayed in faith and in trembling we're writing out that check? I don't mean to focus on money. I, this is, these are just examples. Just writing out that check, trembling, going, wow, this is a big seed, but I want our church to reach our community. And maybe, maybe we're good, but it's our neighbor that needs the healing that we're standing in faith for and that we're praying for. Maybe, maybe it's our neighbors that need to come to Christ. When was the last time that you stood at your window upstairs and looked around at your neighbors and called them into the kingdom in Jesus' name and used your faith? It's not that we no longer need faith. It's that now we get to use our faith for the real stuff. For the big, anybody still here? We get to use our faith for somebody other than ourselves. The Bible teaches us We don't want to get in that dangerous place where we're not in faith anymore because the Bible teaches us that we are to live by faith. We're to live by faith, not by convenience, not by everything we've been able to store up because we walked by faith once. We are to live by faith. Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 4 says the just shall live by faith. Also Romans 1.17 says the just shall live by faith. Guess what Galatians 3.11 says? Anybody? The just shall live by faith. Guess what Hebrews 10.38 says? Anybody want to guess on that one? Everybody say it with me. The just shall live by faith. That's four scriptures that I found in about three minutes in the Bible that say that we're to live by faith. And I think if God put it, the same thing in the Bible four times, he means it. How many of you know he meant it when he said it once? But he he means that we're to live by faith. I think God's trying to tell us something. It's a good thing if you've progressed in your faith to the point that you can pay your bills and not have to drive a car that's held together by duct tape. That's a good thing. But that doesn't mean that we no longer need to walk by faith. Faith to fund kingdom projects. Faith for seeing other people get healed. Faith for our neighbors and those far from God. If Jesus is going to expect faith on the earth when he returns, and if those who are disciples of Jesus are to live by faith, then what exactly is faith? First of all, let's talk about a couple things faith is not. Faith is not a natural life force. I've heard people preach on this subject, and God bless them, I don't want to come to fisticuffs with anybody, but I've heard people use the example when they're teaching on faith that how many of you have faith that the sun's going to come up in the morning even though you can't see it? And that's their example of faith. No, that's science. Science tells you that, that the sun is going to come up tomorrow. Faith is not a natural life force. Now, science doesn't conflict with the word. That's not what I'm saying. They run concurrently. But faith is not natural. Faith is something that's given to us by God through that we cultivate and that we grow in. Faith is not the same as hope. Romans 15, 13 says, Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you Bound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Hope is a good thing. This calls God the God of hope. Hope is a good thing. And this says that we are to abound in hope. But hope is the expression of our inner desire. Hope 
is <clears throat> we can also look at hope as the goal or the object of our faith. Hope. We can have, it's okay to hope that we get healed. It's okay to hope that God's word comes to pass. It's okay to hope that God, God comes through for us. And somebody, that's, hope is the goal. But then faith, Mark eleven twenty four 24 says, Therefore I say to you, whatever things that you ask when you pray, that's hope. Whatever things you ask when you pray, there's your hope. Believe that you receive them. There's your faith. And you will have them. So when you have hope, <clears throat> that's your goal. Hope is what you're really desiring, really wishing to see happen. But faith is what causes it to happen. Hebrews 11.1 1 tells us that faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Faith is the inward manifestation on the inside of us of what we hope for. The Amplified Bible, and those of you who have been in this church a long time, have this memorized because this, this, is, this is maybe my favorite scripture in the world. Amplified Bible says, Now faith is the assurance, the title deed, the confirmation of things hoped for, the confirmation of things that are divinely guaranteed, and the evidence of things not seen. It's the conviction of their reality. Faith is comprehends as fact what cannot be experienced by the physical senses. You can't see it. You can't hear it. You can't taste it. You can't smell it. What's the, you can't touch it. And yet, you know it's real. That's what faith is. Uh, the uh, the old, that's the new revision of the Amplified Bible. The older uh, edition of the Amplified Bible says that faith perceives as real fact what is not yet revealed to your senses. And so you don't feel healed. You don't look healed. I heard you talk. You don't sound healed. But faith says, I know I am. Faith says, I know if I write this tithe check out and I give this tithe check, I know, I know, you, you, you know, you, get, you move from I, I hope God comes through. I'm writing this out and I hope God comes through. Faith goes on the other side of hope and faith says, if I do this, I know that when that opportunity gets there, when that situation gets there, I know that my God Shall Come on, somebody. My God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. I know it. I know it. And no fear. No fear of trusting God. <clears throat> In that same chapter, Hebrews 11.3 says, By faith we understand. If I hear one more preacher say, God created the world out of nothing. No, he didn't. This says, by faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. God created the world out of things that were not visible, but he didn't create the, the worlds out of nothing. He created the worlds with his word. And we are commanded to live by faith. So let me ask you, what have you believed God for this week? Well, well, okay, let me, let me give you a little wiggle room. What have you believed God for this month? What do you got your faith out there? You can't see it, you can't hear it, you can't smell it, you can't touch it, you can't whatever the other thing is. But you...
that at the end of the service, people are going to go back there and tell the elders they want to pray to receive Christ. Amen. It's Baptism Sunday. Whenever the next Baptism Sunday is, I'm believing God in Jesus' name that 20 people are going to get baptized. Come on, let's get our faith out there. If you don't need anything, hey, I got some faith projects. Come up to me afterwards. You don't need anything? I'll give you some stuff. Because I got faith projects. Verse 4, you know, it used to really bother me about Cain and Abel. How many of you, do you know the story of Cain and Abel? Cain, uh, Cain and Abel were Adam and Eve's sons. And Cain was a uh, farmed uh, fruits and vegetables and Abel was a sheep herder, and so Abel, when he offered his sacrifice, he offered sheep because that's what he had. Cain offered fruits and vegetables, and God didn't accept his sacrifice. And I always thought that was really unfair of God to not, why, I, that used to bother me when I was a kid in Sunday school. People, they used to read this story, and I thought, but but what did Cain do that was so wrong? Because, I mean, that's what he had. He didn't have sheep. He had fruits and vegetables. He offered what he had to God, and God didn't accept it. And, of course, Cain then got jealous of his brother Abel and killed him. It's the first, first murder in history. But then, some years later, I discovered Hebrews 11.4. By faith... Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained a witness that he was righteous. Cain's sacrifice was rejected, not because of what he gave, but that he didn't offer it in faith. So when, when we're sowing, when we're tithing and when we're sowing, when we're speaking, whatever we're doing, here again, Jesus said, when I return, will I find faith on the earth? If Jesus returned tonight, would Jesus find faith active in your life? Or have we gone past faith? Don't really need that anymore. Where faith got us where we are, and I'm in good shape now. You don't ever want to be there. Look at your neighbor and say, I don't ever want to be there. <clears throat> now, the testing of our faith... is the reason for the spiritual opposition that you face. The devil, you've given your life to Christ. You're good with God now. How many of you, if you went into eternity tonight, you'd go into eternity tonight and you'd spend eternity with God? How many of you? That's most all of us. So the devil knows he's lost that battle. So why is It's because he's after your faith. Because if he can get at your faith, he can stop you from advancing the kingdom. I, I so love serving in a church where pastors have faith for the lost. I love the improvements, all the improvements that are going on in this building and, and all the service improvements. Going to three services, already filled up two of those. Now, well, now what are we going to do? Uh, but it's all because of the vision of our pastors that are saying it's not enough to have enough room to make you comfortable. Right. And be sure your kids have a good time. It's because we want to reach a community people that are lost, people that are discouraged, people whose marriages are falling apart, people that are in poverty. We want to reach our community with the gospel. And see, the enemy wants to stop us from walking by faith and get us to a place of complacency where we don't need faith anymore. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6. 
In this you greatly rejoice that now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. Anybody in here been grieved by various trials recently? Well, Peter, thank you very much, Peter. We don't appreciate you. <laughs> says, in this you should greatly rejoice. Thank you for the trials. Thank you so much. We're so grateful. Though now for a little while, if need be, you've been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. This says that your faith is more precious than gold. I told, I told Connie... A couple of weeks ago, I, I just, I don't know why I had been thinking about this, but I told her, you know, if, if I were to lose everything, which in Jesus' name I will not, but if I were to lose everything and I were to be marooned on a deserted island and I could only have one possession, what would I take? I'd take my Bible. Because if I have my Bible, I can get it all back. But the genuineness of our faith is more precious than gold, the Bible says. That was the point of that illustration. It's because your faith is the most precious thing you have. It's not your money. It's not your connections. It's not your house. not your cars. It's not any of that. Your faith is the most precious thing that you have because if you've got faith and you can stand on the Word of God and believe Him then there's nothing you can lose that you can't get back. And you can, you can lose a job. That's okay. But I love this job. It's okay. You can get a better one with the word. But here's what I want you to see. We're going to close with this. James 1, 12 through 13. Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he's been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he's tempted, I'm tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does God himself tempt anyone. You see, First Peter, the first scripture that we looked at, 1 Peter 1, 6-7, says that your, the genuineness of your faith is being tried. But who's trying it? God doesn't need to try your faith. He know, God knows the hearts of all men. God knows how much faith you have. You know who doesn't know? The devil doesn't know what's in there. It's like a tube of toothpaste. It can say toothpaste on the outside, but you don't really know what's in there until you squeeze it. And you see what comes out. I should have, I should have done that tonight. I, love, I, I used to use, use an illustration. I used to have a shampoo bottle, but fill it with mud. And I'd ask people, what's in here? And they'd say, shampoo. And then I'd squeeze it out in a dish and it'd be all nasty and yucky. You don't know what's in there until you squeeze it. You don't really know what's in it. And it's the same thing with you. The devil doesn't really know what's in here until he squeezes you. And what's going to happen when he does? I said, what's going to happen when he does? He's going to find out that you're full of faith. That you're full of faith. And the genuineness of our faith is tried. Uh, and, we, and having done all, we stand. And your faith gets tried and you stand. And it gets tried again and, and we stand. And we continue to stand. We continue to stand until finally the devil goes, well, I mean, I, I squeezed their head. I squeezed them in the middle. I squeezed their feet. I squeezed them on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday. Especially Sunday morning on the way to church, I squeeze them then. And all that comes out when I squeeze them is the genuineness of their faith. Will you stand with me? Father, I thank you that you gave us the Word of God that we can stand on your word and we can trust you. We thank you that we can trust you with every area of our lives. There are people here tonight that are struggling in their finances, struggling in their health, 
struggling uh, with their mental and emotional capabilities. There are people in this room that are, that are struggling in their family. People in here that are struggling with their faith. And I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you gave us a way out of that struggle, and that is the Word of God. Then there are those of us here who, we used to have to deal with those things, but we've overcome. We overcame by the Word. We overcame by faith. And now, because of the manifestation of our faith, some of us have gotten complacent. And we don't realize that we're really at a place now where you can use our faith to make kingdom impact. So God, we offer you up our faith tonight. We say that we are people of faith. And that when you return, you will find faith in the earth in us. Say this after me. Father, I thank you that because of your word, you put faith on the inside of me. And Jesus, when you return, you will find faith in the earth, in me. Tonight I commit myself to walk by faith, to walk out the things I need, to get on the other side of what I need, so I can continue to walk by faith. See souls come into the kingdom of God. See my neighbors come into the kingdom of God. See other people healed and delivered. I thank you that I can use my faith to see others set free, to see my church flourish in our community. In Jesus' name, I walk by faith. Amen. God bless you tonight. Thank you.